energy level, your sleep may not respond immediately. We also use a lot of hydration, so urinary symptoms may not respond immediately, but the, in terms of the perception, but they're there. The effect is immediate. It is autonomic. But these are the things that very consistently, in fact, over 95% of the time, this is what happens. You do this procedure on a patient that has these symptoms, and over 95% of the time, they will respond. So this really points, again, to that something's going on specific to the autonomic nervous system. What's also nice is that these are consistent. They're maintained. They're, they're instantaneous effects that are maintained. Now, there are patients who relapse, and that's the part that I'm sort of struggling with. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about the venous anatomy and how it seems to correlate with relapse. But that's the one part about the autonomic dysfunction that I just I can't get a handle on. Um, I've already talked about that. Well, the other point I will make is that when patients do respond, if you, if you go a good solid six months without a relapse, it doesn't look like you do. I mean, I've had patients now that I've treated over two years that are maintaining the benefit. That's a pretty long time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this slide's a little off, apologize for that. Uh, this is a breakdown in terms of the venous anatomy that we have identified, and you can kind of classify at least the venous anatomy by intraluminal, extraluminal. So what I mean by that is, is there an abnormality within the vein itself, or is there something going on outside the vein that is causing this flow obstruction? And we actually, we actually see that most patients who have this, they do have an intraluminal, something inside the vein, causing the problem, and it's actually the valve. So it's, it's not truly a stenosis, it's not really a narrowing, it's, it's basically a baffle would be the best way to describe it. A valve is, is a structure that is a fold of tissue, and we're probably all most familiar with the heart valves, but it's not much different in the vein. And they should move, they should you know, swing open and close as the flow dictates, but if you look at someone who has the CCSVI and you, and you examine in real time, uh, whether it's uh, a venogram or uh, with an um, intravascular ultrasound, the valve doesn't move. It's fixed. It's rigid. It is, it is not a functional device. So it really is a baffle. A baffle is something that increases resistance. And that's what we're seeing with, with the venous abnormalities, increased resistance. The good news about it is ballooning that actually works. It's, it's a very effective and durable treatment. That's fortunate that it's most commonly seen abnormality. What's not so fortunate, um, by the way, I noticed you had a valve. That's why you're doing so well. <laughs> um, what is not as common, uh, and it is something we actually don't have a great treatment for, is a narrowing. And that narrowing, interestingly enough, occurs when there is no valve. So it's, it's, it's almost as if there's a developmental problem where the valve doesn't develop normally, nor does the vein where the valve should be. And so it's very small. It creates a stenosis. And we see that 20 to 25 percent of patients. And with that, it also is increased resistance. It's funneling the flow through a smaller diameter. That involves balloon angioplasty, venous angioplasty, and that's not nearly as good a treatment in terms of its durability and effectiveness. Uh, excuse me, durability, not effectiveness. Uh, at least in our experience, relative to the valvular treatment. And then the, the, the least likely disorder that we see from a venographic point of view is compression, so externally squeezing that vein. That is something that is certainly less than 5% of patients. The good news is, is if you have it, there are treatments, not necessarily within the vein itself, so we are referring our patients who have this for postural therapy, basically. Opening the space with which the vein passes rather than trying to do something to the vein itself because it is an extrinsic, an external abnormality. And it looks like my video is not going to load. All right. We'll skip that. Okay, so um, this is just an intravascular ultrasound depicting what I described with <coughs> this white boundary here and here representing the valve. And, and if you saw the video, you would see that doesn't move. And that should move. That's the valve leaflet itself. It should be going like this, and it doesn't. As I mentioned, when, when you have this particular anatomy, it tends to respond very favorably as far as durability. In other words, you have this procedure done once, and you have a fantastic result that doesn't fade. So if you have this, if you have CCSVI, you really want to have valves. 
it seems to make a difference. Stenosis on the other hand, we rely on venous angioplasty and interestingly enough the results you get with venous angioplasty in CCSVI for a stenotic vein is just what you get if you have an iliac vein that's stenosis, a femoral vein or any other vein in the body. Venous angioplasty we know has a two month patency of approximately 50 percent. Doesn't matter which vein it is. Despite what the health minister of uh, Alberta is saying about venous angioplasty, it actually is quite common. We've been doing it for a long time and it is safe and it is effective. I mean 50 percent patency at two months, while we would certainly like better, that's acceptable in many conditions. So someone needs to address that in Alberta. Um, Here's a picture of, of a narrow vein and you can see that on your left and on the right you can see the narrow vein after a balloon has been inflated. So it does work. You can fix a narrow vein. Admittedly, just venous angioplasty itself is not the best treatment. Um, but if you're suffering from this, I think, I think it's fair to say that it's not unreasonable to undergo a procedure that works half the time when you have pretty significant disability. All right, so um, the only thing I'll comment about on this slide is, is that if you are a vascular specialist and you do venous angioplasty, your, your threshold for placing a stent is quite low. In fact, prior to doing CCSVI, I really didn't do venous angioplasty anymore. I stented veins because elsewhere in the body, venous stents have an outstanding patency. In fact, in some respects, venous stents have better patency than arteries. And there's literature to support this. So the idea that you would stent a jugular vein when you do an angioplasty and it doesn't, doesn't respond as well as you'd like is, is not a significant deviation from your traditional practice. In fact, that would be pretty standard. But what we see actually in a jugular vein is stents don't really work so well. And it's because they clot. I think that's more a reflection of the physiology of jugular venous flow than it is that the stents don't work in that vessel. The fact that it is, is that when you are in the supine position, you have maximal flow in your jugular. And so if you have a thrombotic device like a stent and you're laying down all the time, I, I think the results would be fantastic. We tend to live upright though. So we're either sitting or standing for the majority of the day and your flow actually in your jugulars can go to zero in that position. Typically it's just diminished, but it can be zero. And if you have a stent in any vessel with no flow, it's gonna have a hard time not clotting. So, it's more a function of the unique physiology of a jugular vein than it is the stent themselves, but at this point, I don't think the stents are something that we should be using. Um, there's an exception to that, and as if you have a venous occlusion, the only way it's gonna stay open with any chance is a stent. So I, I do still stent an occlusion, but fortunately occlusions are, are not a, a common problem. All right, so here's a graphical representation of what that compression is. This is uh, an image from a CT scan, and this white structure here is the first cervical vertebrae. The, I don't know if you can appreciate the sort of stippled white structure here that is sort of a flattened oval. That's actually a stent. So this is one of my very early cases. This is a patient who had a very severe narrowing in the upper jugular not even being aware of what the styloid bone is in relative to the jugular vein. I actually treated this with a stent. And this structure right here, this little dot, is the styloid. So you can see that this jugular vein is compressed severely, primarily because the stent's in there outlining it. Well, I don't do that anymore, and unfortunately, these are things that we have learned along the way, but this really, I think, demonstrates what's going on with extrinsic compression really well, having that stent in there. As I mentioned, when you have extrinsic compression, we have, we have a therapy that does work. So we don't have to address it with balloons and stent. They don't work. But postural therapy does. So to run through, at least from the venous perspective, what our experience has been, if you have the valvular type of CCSVI, which is the most common, this is actually a quite effective and durable treatment. If you have a stenosis, it's not as effective, but it's still a reasonable procedure to do. And if you have compressive anatomy, ballooning or stenting have really no role, but, but fortunately we have some alternative therapies that we can get you started on. So now going back to the vagus nerve, how does this all 
fit with what's going on with the vagus. Well, as I mentioned, you've got this tubular structure, this sheath, the carotid sheath, with all three of these organs pass through. It's very dense, fibrous tissue. And if you're going to inflate a balloon, you're going to most likely impact the vagus nerve most of all. How does that work relative to the venous anatomy I just described and the difference in response? Well, if you have a valve, you tend to have, first of all, a larger diameter vein, but more importantly, the vein where you're treating is larger in a patient with a valve. It gets bigger. Like I said, you had valves. So I noticed where your valve was, it bulged outward. So we're gonna use a little bit bigger balloon. If you have a stenotic type, the vein gets smaller where you're gonna treat, you're probably gonna be treating with a smaller balloon. So that subtype will be treated with different size balloons and therefore the potential to compress that vagus nerve is gonna be different with the two different anatomies. So my observation that the anatomy itself was explaining the difference in response could be erroneous. It could be we're using a balloon that fits within the carotid sheath and compresses the vagus nerve fully in patients who have the valvular type Whereas the stenotic type, we're using a smaller balloon that does not fully compress the vagus. Again, this is an observation and just a thought. Don't take this as science. <laughs> so I'd like to summarize in basically talking about dysautonomia. It is a distinct disorder that crosses all the neurodegenerative disorders. It is something that we see. It is well accepted. It has been around for a long time. Autonomic dysfunction has been studied for several decades. It's known to occur with MS. It is a clinical diagnosis. In other words, we don't have to look at your veins to know whether this is something for you. But what's really cool, there's an objective test. We can actually test this. If you look at the R to R inter interval, that's the peaks and valleys of your EKG, a specific peak. If you measure that distance in a normal individual, it fluctuates over time. Your body is constantly adapting to its environment. So it changes the blood pressure, the heart rate, all these variables instantaneously so that you work perfectly. If you have this dysfunction, that's not what goes on. Your heart rate is continuously straight, exactly one set interval between the peaks and valleys and it doesn't vary. That's an objective data point that can be measured. It can be measured before, it can be measured after. We have something we can actually follow and do some studies and say what happens to this objective data point. So we're actually, you know, we're actually gonna be doing that clinically. We need to now do some studies to look at this. I put on here Doppler is irrelevant and I'm sure that's gonna upset some people. I don't find it useful clinically. I didn't find it useful before. And now recognizing the, the autonomic dysfunction component of this and, and knowing that I now have a different test to follow, the only thing I'm gonna order a Doppler for is to make sure that there's no clots. So what is it that we're doing with the procedure? Again, I'm not sure, but one of the things it could be is that we are actually physically manipulating that vagus nerve. So we're, we're doing a procedure in a vein, so it's transvenous vagal modulation. I have no idea if this is really what's going on, but it's, it really makes sense when I look back about the last two years, what we've been doing, what we see. This is a safe procedure, regardless of whether it's modulating your vagus or whether it's fixing your veins, it is safe. We have three published studies clearly showing it's safe, and all the practitioners that I know of have the same experience. It's less than 1% for any significant complication. I think we're ready to move beyond the safety issue. We now need to work on efficacy. And that's not gonna happen without a clinical trial. Unfortunately, it may actually require randomized placebo-controlled trials. I think that's actually, at the very minimum, it's a shame. But it's probably gonna be what it takes. We have to have that happen. We've got to have that happen. And it's only gonna happen with your help. I mean, we are here because of you. Advocacy and activism is why we're here. It's what's going to take us to the next level. So I, first of all, thank all of you. And secondly, I ask that you continue.
I'm not quitting. She's not quitting. 